first half spot on Tartaglia, the first half spot on but at the end. We want to work on this skill guys, we want to work on this skill. Now what will happen if I say to uh, Ying, uh, so you've got a problem chasing things? She'll be like, no, it's not right. When we can say it back the same way, we really get what? In, into the client's world. Yeah, into their world, rapport, and all that. Last week, we spent quite a lot of time going through the art of calibration for the reasons of being able to empathize with people, to be able to see the world through their lens, being able to calibrate and align ourselves and the delivery of the words back to them, not through just the language, but through the nonverbals that go with it. That's what really allows you to feel what people are thinking when they say what they say. When people go up at the end or down at the end, when people whisper a particular word, that's what allows you, if you're able to calibrate your listening to the way that they say things, to the way that they see the situation, the way that they see reality. If you can understand the way that people see reality, then it puts you as a coach in a much better position to be able to help them as an NLP practitioner in a much better way to be able to help them to change, to achieve what it is that they really want. How many people here missed last week's session? Just a couple, a couple of people with their, with their cameras on anyway. At the bottom of this, which I started to rub out the other day, empathy and rapport. Empathy and rapport are the two things that as an NLP practitioner, you will be able to put into your toolkit of objectives when dealing with someone else that will allow you to be a more effective communicator. Empathy and rapport. Remember those two things as an objective for you as a communicator. And today we're going to build on that because what we were just doing, repeating back the problem, is building up on last week and we're going to actually take it a few steps forward and in the process of taking it forward, we will be implementing some revision of what we've learned before in it. And you could see from here on in to be quite an advanced class. But I know a lot of you guys can handle it. And I know uh, Jeremy and Emily will have an extra, extra fun tonight. So this is going to be a bit of an advanced class today. And the reason is, is we're going to do an advanced stuff and there's going to be too much and you know what, if there's too many things coming at you when we do it, if you catch a couple of things, you're going to be doing great. Alright? So when we get into today's class, we're going to build on everything we've done so far and we're going to take you through a process, an NLP process, which is actually a combination of a few processes and it's not normally taught to NLP practitioners, this is more advanced or advanced advanced but I think you guys will get I think you guys will get a fair few pieces of it I don't think you guys will get all of it in fact you won't get all of it because there'll be too much but you will get what's right for you you're gonna love it and this is a bit of a, a process that you can take other people through but would someone here like to be coached in NLP we might also say problem state Problem or problem state. Let's say if someone doesn't have enough money, well, that's a physical thing, not having enough money, but what's the actual problem? They're feeling poor or they're feeling unresourceful. So there's a state. Not having enough money is one thing, but the real problem is 
they don't feel resourceful or something like that. So there's a problem and a problem state. So we identify the problem. What's the problem, Jay? It says what the problem is. And I wrote it down. I procrastinate. And I, 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 I leave off half of the words. And if I take notes, I'll often just start the word and keep writing. We use the Cartesian coordinates. And if you're not quite sure, we can go into what they are. But we're asking all kinds of questions like what's not the problem. And then we do a check-in. We, we look, we're calibrating. And as Yolanda said, I was asking him how it felt. I was asking him to connect. Notice how it feels. And what would you do if the client says it doesn't feel good? That's the way you've been. How do you want to be different and feel better? <laughs> yeah, totally. You totally, you totally can. You totally can. And you can ask them some different Cartesian coordinate problems. You can ask them some different questions. So if, if they connect and it doesn't feel good, that's okay. Just ask them some more questions. Or you can be, hmm, interesting. What's not, 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 not the issue kind of thing. Now, you look, and what happens when you see him and he's, like, smiling and laughing? Then what do you do when they're smiling and laughing? Calibrate and smile back. Yeah. And if we use the same... Did, did, did I use the same words? Like, do we use the same words when they're laughing? What were the two? He had two different things. Let's say I, I told you a story about a black dog and my friend was mauled by a black dog. And... Uh, big lines down their thighs and on their back. But the thing was, my friend's always been afraid of big black dogs ever since. And they look whatever, but they just get really scary. And if I tell you a full story about a black dog and tell you the story, and if you have the vision in your head of a black dog, what would happen if you saw a black dog and after this lesson you went outside and there was a big black dog? You would relive, yeah. Even though you just heard the story from me, if you really envision the story, if I tell it really well, it's in your head, you get out and you see a big black dog, it's scary. It's like mm. as children you watch a scary movie about aliens and you might laugh but later on you go camping or you're outside at night time suddenly you're outside you see the stars and it gets scary well our future pacing is we're seeing us in the future being successful so the more we see us in our future being successful exactly the same thing but we're setting ourselves up for future so when we do a couple of future paces in future, seeing how it's different. In future, seeing what's different. We're taking his attention outside, away from the problem. In future, noticing what's different. And there's so much to notice, isn't there, Jay? There's so many other things you can notice. So in future, noticing all the things that's different, what's different? If he sees this in his mind a couple of times, he can do one future pace. Uh, you might want to do three or four future paces. But if, if I tell you a story about a person and a black dog and the person ran like real fast, and if I told you the story four times about different people, black dog and I ran real fast, and then 
You know, I've got a daughter, she's six years old. So you can do one future pace, but if you do a handful of future paces, you can condition the new response. And one response I might like to condition is that you don't celebrate until money's in the bank. Client says they're going to pay great. When the money's in the bank, celebrate. And feel great about yourself. Or perhaps we, we can even future pace the money conversation and see yourself being really comfortable and relaxed having the money conversation. And if you future pace that four or five times, you'll be whatever you like in your future pace. Pretty cool, hey? I think that now would be a very good time to just set all of that aside and run through very quickly the idea of the Cartesian logic in a way which will be a lot faster than the way that we covered it on Thursday, but you will strike that Wednesday, but you will understand it much faster. There are four questions, and these four questions represent four quadrants in a four-point grid. The questions are very simple, but incredibly powerful. Because Adrian is being kind and, and drawing along, uh, in the top left is the question, what would happen if you did? So this is a positive and a positive. What would happen? Positive. If you did? Positive. Simply A, B, I or I am. B, did procrastinate, no, not procrastinate, did make something or I am good enough or I am Adrian. The next set of questions, what would happen if you didn't? Again, A and B. But this time, underneath the A, we have a positive and under the B, we have a negative. And I'm sure that a lot of you can see what's going to happen next. The third question, what wouldn't happen if you did? Again, we have an A and a B part to the question, but we have a negative under the A and we have a positive under the B. What wouldn't happen if you did? And finally, what wouldn't happen if you didn't? So we have a negative and a negative. These four questions will elicit a different response from the person whom you're speaking with. If, for example, I said to... Janine, what is one of your desires or your problems? If you would be happy to share. One of your, my desires or problems. Did, did you do your homework? Uh, um, sure. <laughs> Well, being financially free okay. is one that's, of them. That's, that's enough. Okay. So considering yourself being financially free, what would happen if you were? So I'm just changing the words slightly so it fits with her desire in the way that she spoke her desire. I, I would, my daily uh, life uh, would look differently also, I would have less anxiety and worries and stress. Okay. Now, if I was to ask you, and this time I don't want you to respond, but if I was to say, what would happen if you didn't? No, sorry, what would happen if you weren't financially successful? Now, everybody, watch, watch Janine. Okay. Now that everyone's watching you, <laughs> you've completely shifted, but that's fine. 
Now, let me ask you a different way. And what wouldn't happen if you were financially free? And now for the final one, what wouldn't happen if you weren't financially free? With Chris's, it was I procrastinate. And I, I, I flipped the I upside down. I flipped the I on its head. How can you flip I on its head? That's like, how you've been. How do you want to be different? So I, I'm unhappy. Say it again, Raquel. I'm unhappy. That's how you've been. How is it going to be different? Because I'm not unhappy. That's just, I might be unhappy right now, but my life's so much bigger than that. It's so much bigger. So we can actually flip the eye upside down. Like you're procrastinating now, but you're more than you're more than procrastination, aren't you, Jay? You're mm -hmm. more than Jay. Mm -hmm. Unlike before, or unlike before when you had this problem or the other parts of you, I'm actually doing this. I'm actually doing this, a negative thing on the eye. And if you don't say those questions exactly right, is that okay? You can do whatever you want with the questions. You can try to, you can try to spin the eye on the head. You can try to spin the financial freedom on the head. You can try to flip procrastination. You can try not, 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 not. You can try multiple knots. You can try changing the knots. Does it matter? Yeah, what's the result you want to get from Cartesian logic? I've deliberately given you a structured framework to be able to deliver this. Hmm. Most people, most of the time, make statements, I want to be better, or I'm not good enough, or I don't have enough money or most people hate me. They're usually an A, B frame in the way that they respond. And so the way that I have posed these questions and written them in the chat, it provides you with a very easy framework to be able to approach most people most of the time with most of the things that they're likely to say. Adrian is exactly right that there will be times that are different and that will require flexibility on your part. If you have an understanding of how these things work at their basic level and what the objective of the exercise is, which is to identify all four possible ways of looking at the situation, then you will be able to change the way that you ask the questions. You can change the order that you ask them, but the outcome will be the same because you followed the formula. Now this has served very nicely to demonstrate that a lot of this process is not about the coach understanding what the client is talking about, but to help the client understand what the client is talking about. When you lend language to a problem, then you create structure around that problem and the problem can be climbed and overcome. The language is the tool that allows us to do that. To, to refer back to E's question just a little while ago, what do you do if a client doesn't want to do this? We've now approached this situation from a one, two, three, four approach. What would happen if you did? What would happen if you didn't? What wouldn't happen if you did? What wouldn't happen if you didn't? When you are in a coaching client situation like that, and you hit them with question one, question two, question three, question four, it can seem like you are taking them through a process. And that process can be beneficial in many situations. But for some people who don't like to be in a structured coaching environment, 
but they want to have somebody to lead them on a journey rather than force them to make a change. An approach to this same thing can be achieved by using what I call conversational NLP. And that is where that you engage in a standard style conversation with someone, but you incorporate these four questions into the conversation. When you start to take the client on their coaching journey, you bring in these questions. It allows the client to be able to think about the answers to your questions, but they're not being forced into a situation which they're not comfortable with. Particularly the negative questions, what wouldn't happen if you did, what wouldn't happen if you didn't, they can be uncomfortable. And they can be even more uncomfortable when they are contrasted with what would happen if you did, which for many people is a very easy question to answer. Comparing that to the difficulty that goes with what wouldn't happen if you didn't, that can cause that discomfort that can break the rapport that you have been able to, to develop with your client and destroy the relationship that you've been building. In a conversation, I recommend that you ask all four, but spread them out. If you feel that through your calibration with your client, that they are becoming resistant to the questioning technique, then that's your opportunity to change and move into a different model or a different strategy and then come back. There's no time frame that these questions need to be delivered. They don't even need to be delivered in the same coaching session. Just to, just to put a nice little underline under what Adrian said, when you have helped somebody to reach a state of confusion, that is when you as an NLP practitioner are at your most influential. That is where you can use your techniques and your skills to be able to guide them towards the outcome that they have told you that they would like in an ecological way. That's where you have the opportunity to assist on their journey.